Yeah. Webinar is broadcasting to all attendees. Perfect. So now we'll just wait for people to come in. There we go. So it's the Q&A function people can access, isn't it? Yes. Cool. Um, and then the chat function as well. And chat. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm. Oh, well, both will pop up, I imagine. Yes. Okay. People coming in now. I've got 17 there. Wow, good stuff. Excellent. Welcome, everybody. Just give it a few more minutes. So used to seeing faces popping up, you know, I use the uh, the meetings rather than the webinar. Oh, than the webinar. So, but... <laughs> yeah. Where is everybody? <laughs> Okay, give it one more minute and then we'll make a start. Hi everyone, so um, yeah, I might, we may as well uh, get this kicked off. So welcome from the Auckland Waikato New Zealand Legal Executives um, Society. Uh, I'm Pip, uh, I'm a past president of the, the committee and, uh, and now a friend of the committee. So I'm just helping out with the webinar today and it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Rich Ellis, who's a corporate wellness manager and health and man movement coach, who's uh, gonna take us through some tips about finding our new normal post COVID. So over to you, Rich. Awesome, lovely. Thank you very much, Pip. Thanks for that lovely warm welcome. Um, I've just been scrolling through. I can see um, there's a, a, a significant email bias, so it's good to know who the audience is. Um, and please feel free to raise a hand, not that I necessarily know how to respond to that, but we've got the Q&A function. We've got the, um, the chat function. So, you know, I, I envisage this being a fairly open mic type of um, affair, fairly relaxed. Um, I've got some activities for you guys to do uh, as we go through. Um, so that uh, it's, uh, you know, it's fairly interactive. I don't want you to sort of sit here and just listening to my head bobbing up and down for an hour and a half or however long it's going to take. Um, I really want you to, um, you know, come away from this with a decent amount of information and some of it written down and recorded so that, uh, you know, you can get some, some real value from it and hopefully jog your memory on some of the things that we've gone through uh, when you look back at it. So who am I? Um, as, uh, as Pip said, I'm a corporate wellness manager, so I do things with, um, with businesses in, in the health space. So presentations like this, one-offs, uh, and also run sort of longer uh, programs that can, can be uh, an ongoing relationship with, with businesses that want to really invest in their team. Um, and I'm also a health and movement coach, so I've got, a, I've got a, a personal training background, and so there's still movement in my, um, in my life in terms of the way that I help people. And so um, that's a, just a little hint to you that we're not going to be sitting down for the hour and a half either. There will be some movement. So I'm not going to I'm not going to get you all hot and sweaty. I'm just going to get you moving and just give you some tips that you can uh, add into your daily routine so that when you are sitting and you need a break, you've got something that you can do that um, can be useful for your body and your health. So I guess. Um, Today is all about um, finding new norm, understanding, uh, I'm going to give you a background about, about stress um, and how that plays its part, the uncertainty of the times we're living in with, with COVID and how we're sort of, we're always adjusting because there's so much uh, unknown out there in terms of what, what's going on with, um, with COVID. We're, we're fortunate enough to live in a, a country where it feels like um, things are reasonably stable compared to places like the US. Um, and then, you know, somebody like me who lives in Greenhive suddenly ha becomes the epicenter of COVID and, um, and everybody's looking at you sideways as if, you know, you may have it yourself. And so in that ongoing uncertainty um, can certainly wreak, wreak, havoc on our, wreak havoc on our health. And um, today we're going to sort of unpack some of that stuff. Uh, now, I know you guys are obviously in the legal profession, and it's probably fair to say that in good times and in bad times, we always need the lawyers. We always need your help. 
Um, and I suspect that, um, you know, you guys have been working pretty hard, uh, regardless of whether you're in lockdown, whether you're working from home, whether you're working from your office, um, it probably hasn't stopped. So giving yourselves a little bit of time and a little bit of uh, uh, opportunity to take a break and, and do things like this is a, a really great way of breaking your day up, breaking your week up and, um, and learning, right? We're enriching our brains, we're giving ourselves knowledge. So um, let me skip to slide number two. <laughs> if I can. All right. Okay, so you will need a few bits of bits of equipment. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes if you need them now to grab yourself a, a rubber band. If you're sitting at your desk or you have colleagues around you who can run and get them for you, that would be great. We need a rubber band. Doesn't matter how big or small. Um, and we need a, a pad of some kind. So um, a jotter or one of those beautiful legal pads that you guys have. Are they um, are they yellow in in the in New Zealand as well? I, I know that the Americans love the yellow the yellow pad, so I'm assuming that um, may just be an American thing. So I'll give you a second, and um, once you're once you've rushed around, once you've got your rubber bands, that's that's the uh, that's the key piece because I imagine you have pen and paper ready. We'll get into it. We are going to be doing some activities as we go. So uh, when those activities come up, I'll let you know. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is um, I've added some screens in here which are yellow, and those would be perfect opportunities if you want to raise a hand, ask questions, use the chat function, whatever it is you want, so that we can communicate as we go through this. Feel free to, to jump in and, uh, and use that function when you see a yellow screen, because that's kind of a nice little juncture uh, through the slides. Um, but if there's anything really pressing, feel free to, to uh, type away as you, as you see fit. So hopefully everybody's got a pen, everybody's got a pad, and everybody has a rubber band. All will be explained. So let's get into a bit of background in terms of, of stress. So stress can be a good thing, and it can be a bad thing. Yes, um, you know, COVID has brought certain levels of stress to different industries for different reasons. Um, but the definition of stress is a reaction to a stimulus that disturbs our physical or our mental equilibrium. And uh, you would probably have been through stressful events at various different times in your life, and you know what that feels like to be knocked off balance. Um, and sometimes those are the things that make us stronger. So stress in a healthy sense is what helps build resilience in our minds and our bodies. And so if you've been through things that have tested you over time, you know that you can handle that, you know that you have the ability to deal with challenging situations, and therefore you're more resilient if that same thing comes up or something similar comes up again. And I guess that's the predictability of things that have happened that may reoccur that is different with COVID. You know, COVID is something that is, as, they, as it's been reported, you know, it's a once in a hundred years event. Um, the Spanish flu was probably the last time that something like that significant occurred. And so there are lots of unknowns. There are lots of unprecedented activities and, and events that have knock on effects to the economy, to our health and to our everyday lives. So framing stress and framing our challenges in a positive light is an important way of um, embracing the stress rather than seeing it as something negative and something that will have uh, a negative impact on our bodies. I'll go into this in a little bit more detail later. I just wanted to frame this to start with uh, and help uh, you get a good handle on, on the fact that stress is, is inevitable. It's part of our life. Um, and the way we see it, the perception we have around it is really, really important in terms of the impact that it has on our bodies. All right. Okay, so rubber band time. I'm gonna get you guys to uh, hold your rubber bands between your thumbs. So I'm gonna assume you're gonna be doing the same I am because I can't see you. So there's a fair bit of trust going on here. So um, the, the definition of resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. Now that's certainly the human side of it, or it's the ability of a substance or an object to spring back into shape 
uh, or elasticity. And so that's why I've asked you guys to grab yourselves a real band. So what, what I'd like you to do is just to, to take that band as far as you feel it can possibly go before it snaps <laughs> or before it gets to the point where you actually think it may not return back to its normal shape. And this is just a metaphor for um, stress challenges we have in our lives. The, the equilibrium would be where the rubber band is just sitting at its standard length. Our bodies and our brains are then tested when the band is stretched. So we're, we're pushed beyond our normal uh, capabilities sometimes, and we're taken out of our comfort zone. And that band has the, the ability, and our brains and bodies have the ability to go in and out of that situation. Now, as I said, stress is a good thing for those, those reasons. However, when the band is stretched or our brains and our bodies are taken to the end limit for long periods of time, potentially that band can snap. That can take us into, into fatigue from a human point of view, but also it could become misshapen, right? So we may be able to get the band looking like what's kind of looking like how it started, but actually it's not quite as has just lost a little bit of elasticity. It's not quite as uh, bouncy as it was when we started. And so I just wanted to use the rubber band metaphor for you so that you could get some context in terms of how our bodies deal with it, because it's very, very similar. We're designed to be able to, to stretch and, and be pushed out of our comfort zone for short periods of time. However, if it's an extended period of time, then there are potentially bigger consequences in terms of our metabolism, in terms of our hormone balance, in terms of our mood, in terms of our mental health. And so having the ability to spring back, having tools and resources to be able to spring back so that the band has a longer life, a healthier life, we can keep using the band. You know, we don't need to go to the stationary shop for a long time because this one's gonna work just fine for a good deal longer. And so if you apply that to your life, it's important that we give ourselves that time to spring back. And we're gonna talk about recovery a little bit later, uh, but hopefully the, uh, hopefully the rubber band has done its job in your mind. And that's just how my mind works. So I, I hope the same is for you. So let's, uh, let's go through here. Okay. So in, in context of, of stress and adversity, and I talked earlier about uh, perception of stress in terms of there's good stress, there's bad stress, um, there's extended periods of stress, but it's our perception of it that is important. And I'll go into a bit more depth of that in a minute, but I just wanted to use this, <clears throat> these images here to give you more context in terms of our perception. So these two ladies here, they're stuck in a traffic jam. Let's say they are both stuck in a traffic jam. The, the scenery is slightly, slightly different, but they're both stuck in a traffic jam. They're both driving into central Auckland. So, you know, we all know Auckland traffic is pretty ordinary. It can take a long time to get nowhere. And so, you know, it's something that sits outside our circle of influence. We can't control the traffic. There are only so many routes that we can take to get to where we want to go. And so our ability to... Uh, stay calm and relaxed and, and not react to the traffic is a really, really important part in terms of how we deal with stress on a bigger scale. So the lady on the left here, you know, she's stuck. She, she's not going anywhere. She's getting agitated. You know, she's just about to probably slam her horn or shout at somebody. And she's not dealing with it very, very well. Lady on the right here, she looks as though she's pretty happy. She's probably got the radio going. You know, she, she's probably stuck two cars behind the other lady, but her perception of the situation is quite different. So her, she knows that the traffic is, is going to go eventually. She knows there's not a lot that she can do about it while she's stuck there. So she's got her favorite tunes on. She's chilling out to her favorite tunes and she's enjoying the, it looks like she's got a decent view, but we're assuming she's in traffic. So again, this is just illustrating it's how we perceive the situation and so what we can influence and what we can't influence as to how our day goes, as to how we're going to feel for the rest of the day. Because if we have a really bad start stuck in traffic, the rest of the day isn't gonna to look too much prettier probably. And I said I'd go into a little bit more depth. There was a girl, uh, a lady who's a, a researcher called Kelly McGonigal. So if any of you guys are really interested in TED Talks, 
it's time to um, to take a note here. Her name's Kelly McGonigal. She did a TED talk called How to Make Stress Your Friend. And what she did was around the, the, the entertaining part, one of the things that she talked about was a study that she quoted of people that were studied in terms of, they were questioned on their perception of stress. So they were asked, do you think stress will help your health or hinder your health? And so they basically had these two groups. There was a group that said, yes, it will help my health and um, no, it will hinder my health. And what they did was they let those two groups go off into their, their, their lives and they studied the death records. And interestingly, what happened was those, the group that said that they thought stress would hinder their health or would have an impact on their health were actually dying younger than the group that said that it was actually going to help their health. So they had everyday lives, but it was their belief around um, what stress was going to do to them that made them, uh, that they, they said that the, that the correlation was that that, that, that meant a, a shorter life. So stress can have a real impact on our, our bodies and our brains. If we believe it's going to be harmful for us, it will. If we believe it's going to be good for us, it can be. Um, and one other reference, which again, if you're really interested in, in this stuff, a guy called Bruce Lipton, he's a, uh, an American dude who wrote a book, interesting book called The Biology of Belief. So if you're interested in, um, in learning a little bit more about um, biology and in terms of how our, how our brains have such an impact on our physical being, really, really interesting uh, read. And it sort of plays into to what Kelly talked about in terms of people's perceptions of stress. And what he did was he had all the, 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 the Petri dishes in the lab and he would take stem cells and he put these cells into the dishes and then he would surround them with different chemical environments. So the cells were identical and they went into different dishes. Now, he put a healthy environment for one and he put an unhealthy environment for the other. And the, the different chemistry around those cells were the equivalent of a, a happy body, a body that isn't in stress and a body that is in stress. So the cortisol was higher, the adrenaline was higher. And what happened was the, the, the cells in those dishes behaved differently. So the cells that were in the, the happier, healthier environment thrived and grew. And the cells that were in the dish that were in the unhealthy environment or the, the stressed environment withered. And so, you know, he, he, was, he was demonstrating on a very basic molecular level that the environment that we create in our bodies has a direct impact on our cell health and our body's health. And so hopefully that helps set the scene for you guys and gives you an understanding of, um, you know, the, the difference between stressed and unstressed and what can happen. Just gonna have a sip. So just uh, um, a little bit more background in terms of how it works in our body. So we have our, our nervous system. We have our, our central nervous system, which has different branches. One of those branches is called the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is responsible for things that we don't even have to think about. For example, when our heart beats, uh, when we breathe, digesting food, uh, lots of um, automatic systems that just occur. Otherwise, if we had to think about them, we'd be exhausted and we'd have no time to do anything else. So our nervous system cleverly gets on with all these jobs. And, um, and it has two branches, this autonomic nervous system. It has the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, which you may have heard of. Now, the sympathetic is that, um, that fight or flight mode. So when we're keyed up, when we're in that stress state that you know, can be useful. It can help us get jobs done. It can help us achieve deadlines. It can help us be more productive. You know, you could see it as being your best self in terms of um, being in that state, but it's only designed to be there for short periods of time. And on the other side of the same coin in this branch of the nervous system, we have the parasympathetic. And so obviously para means the opposite of, of, of uh, the other thing. And so parasympathetic is also known as our rest and digest state or our thrive state. There are lots of different nicknames for these because sympathetic and parasympathetic is, um, is not normal language. So rest and digest is, um, is where we're in that relaxed state. 
We don't have high levels of, of cortisol running through our system and, um, and adrenaline. And uh, you know, it's the same as sort of reading a book or being on holiday and just being quite chilled out and relaxed. Now our bodies sort of slide between these two states. We don't always spend all of our time in one or all of our time in the other. Often there's a, it's a sliding scale. And um, when we get seriously stressed, obviously then we shift full speed into sympathetic and when we're almost asleep, relaxed, then we're probably completely in parasympathetic. Our heart rate comes down. Now, in those two different states, different things go on in our bodies. And obviously, fight or flight was designed to help us survive. And, um, you know, back in our caveman days, if we walked out of our cave and there was a, uh, a rainbow looking to the left and there was a saber toothed tiger to the right, it wouldn't have been much use for us to automatically take in the, the rainbow and go, oh, how beautiful is that? while the saber-toothed tiger takes us down and eats us. So we are wired for danger. And obviously, if we came out of our caves, the first thing we'd do is either run or climb a tree and make sure that that saber-toothed tiger didn't get us. So we are wired for this, um, this awareness of danger. And so that comes back to the perception of, um, of what our state is and, and whether something is uh, as a danger or a threat to us or whether it's not. When we're in that fight or flight state though, different things happen. So our body prioritizes energy. So it deploys uh, glucose into our system, gives us the ability to, uh, to climb that tree or run away. You know, do our jobs really well, achieve that deadline. But at the same time, it takes blood away from our brains and it takes blood away from our guts, which means that it can have an impact on our digestion. It can have an impact on our overall health if, if gut health deteriorates. And the brain has so many different compartments. So it shifts the work from the prefrontal cortex where we do all of our creative thinking and it shifts it to an, a more, um, an older part of our brain. And, um, and, it, and it gives us the, um, it gives us enormous and instinctive behavior, which means that we're not using that front part of our brain, the, the creative side of our brain. So what do we do? How do we stay out of that? fight or flight state. What I'm going to do is just give you one more metaphor and then we're going to, we're going to do a little bit of exercise with our pens and our pads. But I just wanted to um, uh, use another metaphor here with the stress bucket. And um, the stress bucket is uh, something that we all have. Everybody has a stress bucket. Yours may not be green. It could be a completely different color. I like green. So green's definitely my stress bucket. And um, everybody's of different sizes. So, you know, that might be one of those mini plant pots that you can get, or that could be a full size bucket. So everybody has a different capacity. So being aware of what capacity you have is a really, really important part of being able to manage that stress response and how you deal with life's challenges. So there's always going to be things adding into the bucket. We know that that's just daily life, but there's a little tap on there and that tap is your ability to cope and your ability to release some of that stress from the bucket. So with, with that metaphor in place, what I'd love to do is to, um, I've got two exercises. We'll probably run them back to back because I thought we were gonna be breaking into um, smaller groups, but we, what you can do is do this on your own, or if you've got colleagues around you, wherever you're sitting, feel free to include your colleagues in this first exercise. So. What we're going to do is we're going to, with the, the, the stress bucket metaphor in your mind, I'm gonna get you to grab your pads and ideally do two columns. So we've got an in column, we've got an out column, and we've got a line down the center of the page. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna set my timer for, let's go five minutes. So we'll have two and a half minutes um, filling the in column. So what adds to your stress bucket and what takes away? What do you do to take away from your stress bucket or to reduce the load in your stress bucket? So I'm going to set my timer and I'm going to get you guys to uh, start filling that in. Think about the things that adds to your bucket and the things that you do to release out of your bucket. All right, the timer is going on now. Okay, we're ticking down. And 
and um, I'll get you to either raise your hand or put a comment in once you guys are done. I'll give you the halfway mark so that you can do the out column. And if you're ahead of time, feel free to put your hand up or uh, something in the chat to say you're, you're ahead of time. Well done, Pip. You're too fast. So if you um, if you're still going, that's all good. But if not, you can flick over to the out column. So, oh, brilliant! Look at you guys, all efficient. So I'm assuming you've just done the ins, and if you have finished your ins, then let's go to the outs. Two and a half minutes is far too long for you guys. Highly efficient people, I can tell. So if you are sticking to the timelines, we've done our two and a half. So I'm going to switch you over to activity two, which we're running straight off the back of the line. And what do you do to empty your stress bucket? What activities do you do to alleviate some of that stress or the days, the days stresses? Nearly there, got about a minute to go. Hopefully you've got a, um, a decent list on both sides, but Not sure if that's just frozen on my end or are you still there, Rich? Okay, I'll just try contact him. Um, could you hear me, Carlo, or is it just Rich that's frozen? Okay. Okay, sorry guys, it looks like we've lost Rich. Um, I'll just pop, her, pop myself on mute and stop my video and I'll just give him a call. Um, I'm guessing it might be an internet uh, problem at his end. Hang on one moment.
Hi guys, um, so I've spoken to Rich, he just had a slight power cut at his house, so he's just waiting for his internet to reboot, uh, and then he'll be joining us back in. Um, oh, here we go, I think he's coming now, there we go, hi. <laughs> Man, I can't believe it, <laughs> cannot believe it, of humblest apologies. There we go. That, so I've made you host again, so you should be able to share your screen and... Thank you. Thank you. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> technology, technology, right? Like, we can't always... Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I've got some words to say in a minute. Don't you worry. <laughs> okay. Let me just... Oh, um, so <laughs> I love Sandra's comment there. Did that stress you? <laughs> <laughs> Very topical. <laughs> Hang on, I've got the wrong share screen. So let me try again. There, share. Okay, okay. how are we looking? <laughs> Good, back on, that's the okay. first slide. So I think we'll jump ahead a few. Yeah, 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 yep, yep. No, just, just checking you've got it. Good, 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 okay. Yeah, you're coming through. Ah. All the time. There we okay. go. Okay, <laughs> right. Let me compose myself. Okay, so. That wasn't deliberate, but actually it was a good little test because um, <laughs> you know when the adrenaline's pumping and um, you know, you're know you speaking in public, you then add something else on top of that. You've got, yeah, doesn't, doesn't go so well. Not a great combination of factors. So uh, apologies guys. And it was actually a, uh, a lamp. My lamp died on me. The bulb must have gone, but because it's still plugged into the electricity, into the power here, it tripped my, um, one of my switches in the garage, which meant half the house went, which meant, of course, internet went. So that's enough of my, my troubles. <laughs> so back to where we were. Hopefully we have uh, an in column and an out column filled in. I'm really keen before we move on, there is a yellow screen coming, really keen just to hear one word comments or a couple of words, just to see um, what you've done. Is, is one bigger than the other? Um, is is, is it balanced? What's, what's, what's the page looking like for you? Thanks, Sandra. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Here we go. People are getting chatting. Ian has larger items uh, than out. Cool. Fairly balanced, Angela. Nice. Good job. Excellent. More out than oh, awesome. Serena. Fantastic. Thank you for your comments. Really appreciate it. It's nice to get the feedback because I can't see you. So I have really, I can't read any faces. Uh, it's really frustrating not to be able to, uh, to see you guys. So thank you so much for those comments. More in than out. More in than out, but close. Thanks, Lauren. That's good. That's good. That's good. So hopefully um, that's just given you a bit of a, an opportunity to reflect on where you're at now, the tools that you've got in your toolkit and, um, and how much balance there is, you know, what's your bucket like? So if you've got a nice balanced list, um, then, you know, it doesn't really matter whether your bucket's big or small because you're going to be able to buffer what's going on. But if you had a really small bucket and it was thimble size and your in list is bigger than your out list, that would be a little bit of a, a tap on the shoulder for me to say, oh, okay, what can I do about this? Do I need to work on what's going in? Can I manage what's going in? Thinking about the color influence, the two ladies in the cars, how do you perceive things? And is that having an impact? Or alternatively, do I need to grow my list of tools for the out list so that I can buffer the stuff that's going in? Because some of that stuff will be outside of your control. Um, and if it is outside of your control, should it be something that you'd be concerned about? Should it be something that you worry about? And is it worth thinking about only the things you can control that uh, you kind of, you know, that, that may, you may let get to you? Uh, way more in than out, full, ha <laughs> ha. Thanks, Marianne. Love the honesty. Cheers, Marianne. Awesome. Okay, we're going to move on. So um, that was good. We've got a yellow screen. We're skipping over. So. I wanted to um, just talk a little bit about recovery uh, before we get into some of the tools, because 
that rubber band that we played with earlier, of course, when it bounces back to its normal length, that doesn't just happen automatically. There are things we need to do to allow that to happen from our, our own bodies and our brain's points of view. Um, and one of those is recovery. Now, different people need different things. So when I talk about the following things, and obviously you can see we've got a bit of a sleep cycle going on here, this isn't specific to you. This just gives you some general information because you will probably know what works for you in terms of recovery. Is it going for a walk when you get home from work? Or is it sitting and reading a book? Or is it playing with your kids or your dog or um, spending time with your partner? So there's no one right answer. Really, it's about finding what works for you. But I just want to give you some of the science so that you understand what's going on internally because then you can leverage that and use your advantage. Now, there's a couple of things here that I want to talk about before we talk about the sleep specifically. And obviously sleep is our most anabolic state. So you've heard of anabolic steroids that bodybuilders uh, take to get all buff and muscly. It's a, it's, it's a state which allows our bodies to recover, to repair. So anabolic means we are building. And you may have heard of the word catabolic, Catabolic, it means we are breaking down. Essentially, when we're awake and our metabolism's running, we are catabolic. So we are breaking those, those some cells down. We've got waste products. Uh, we excrete that waste and our bodies go about their everyday lives. When we're asleep, and I mean decent sleep rather than broken sleep, um, our bodies are anabolic. And so the re cell repair occurs. The brain um, process everything from the day's work. Um, and we hopefully have a good night's sleep, wake up refreshed, ready to go the next day. We should be, when I say refreshed, that means most things have reset themselves. So we've recovered. However, that isn't always the case. Now, I just want to talk to melatonin and cortisol. Now, I talked earlier about the stress state and cortisol being uh, one of those stress hormones. And it's, it's a really important one because it's an anti, uh, sorry, it's, its job is an anti-inflammatory. However, long periods of time with cortisol in our systems, in our system, actually becomes inflammatory, and um, inflammation is the root of all disease. So, melatonin is our sleep hormone, and cortisol works like a seesaw opposite to uh, cortisol. So, when one's up, the other's down. When one is down, the other's up. And you can see the red and the blue lines. So I just want to talk through cortisol to start with. So it goes up in the morning. It gives us energy for the day. Um, it's, its highest point is probably a few hours after waking up. And then by the middle of the day, it starts to decline. So it's on this, this uh, downwards curve as we go through the afternoon. This is a healthy pattern for cortisol. So this isn't now, uh, this would be the textbook line rather than what's actually going on in your body. Could be different. So it comes down, it comes down, it comes down, and it meets, um, it meets the, the melatonin levels at about the same time, around six-ish. So, you know, roughly when the sun's going down, at daylight saving it excluded. And then at that point there, you see the gray, the gray portion there looks like a Trivial Pursuit cheese. And um, it's that wind down period between six and sort of 10 when we want to be giving our bodies time to, you know, we'll be having dinner. We might be watching back and, you know, maybe watching a bit of TV uh, or socializing with friends or exercising, whatever it may be. But that's that wind down time where melatonin starts to build up. So the blue line now, it's low during the day. Otherwise, we'd be sleepy all day and we don't want that. But then as the evening kicks in, it starts to build up. And it builds that sleepiness so that by about 10-ish, we're quite, you know, we're ready for bed. We, you know, we've had a long day and the, and the, the hormones inside our body are actually telling us what we need to do. So long as we listen to it. So we want to be dimming the lights. We want to be watching our exposure to blue light. Um, otherwise, those things are going to you know, stimulate um, cortisol and, and suppress melatonin. And that's not going to set us up for a good sleep. Now... Once we're asleep, the first part of the night is all about physical repair. So uh, between about, and this, this piece of the cheese is between 10 and two. So if, you're, if you've had a really big physical day, let's say you've been on your feet all day 
uh, you may have gone to the gym, uh, you may have done a run, or there may be lots of physical stuff that you've done. The repair that needs to occur for that, for your body to get back to zero, is between 10 and two. And if you're late to bed, if you're late after 10, you're losing out some of that physical repair. So if you can make 10 a good bedtime, I'm, I'm before 10 nowadays, I'm sort of like a 9.30 lights out because I just, you know, age is catching up with me. But um, yeah, so that physical repair is between 10 and two. And now I'm gonna show you another slide in a minute and I'll show you some, some sleep tracking that I've done and I can see, show you how it, how it reflects. The second part of the night, so from about 2 a.m., so this is the purple cheese, between 2 a.m. and six, and some people get up before six, is that psychological repair. So that's when we have our REM sleep. That's when our brains are doing their recovery stuff. The body's kind of done its stuff, and then the brain's doing its, 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 um, its repair. It's getting rid of waste products out of our brains from all the metabolic activity. I'm going to talk about how, how hungry our brains are in a minute. And, and so we have that, um, that last four hours, two till six, where our brains are going back. It's filing all the things away. It's getting all the paperwork tidy. It's straightening all the filing cabinets up. And, um, and then it's ready back to zero, ready for the next day. So let me just show you what I mean in terms of uh, sleep recovery. So on the right-hand side here, you can now see, uh, I had to dig for this. This wasn't easy to find. There's no significant movement during your sleep. And that's unheard of for me. So that's why it's, I'm showing off. So this is uh, taken from, I've got a ring that I wear, an Aura ring, O-U-R-A. If you're interested in tracking your sleep and you don't like to do it with a, a Fitbit or a watch because the light turns on or it's too cumbersome, it's a decent investment, but it's an amazing uh, tool in terms of tracking your sleep. So I've got the, the yellow and the purple arrows matching each other here. So you can see the two on the left are the same as the two on the right in terms of the period of time that you're recovering during your sleep. So you can see the deep sleep kicks in pretty much straight away just before 10 p.m. And there's two decent blocks of deep sleep which add up to an hour and four minutes, which is, is okay for my age. Deep sleep gets less and less and less as we age. So setting yourself up for a good deep sleep is, is, is really important, getting to bed uh, at a decent time so you can maximize that, that, um, that deep sleep. It's the deep sleep where the heart rate drops and we're really recovering our physical beings. Um, so that's the yellow arrow, so that's the physical. And then we've got some, some light sleep up until about 2 a.m., which ties in nicely with what I was saying. And then we've got this light blue where the purple arrow is, and that's the, that's the REM sleep and it cycles, right? It doesn't just stay a solid block. So we, I, got, I managed to get a, an hour and 54 REM sleep that night. This is unheard of. I mean, I just, I separated when I saw this one. Um, and so that's that brain repair between that two and six. And then I was up just before six, but anything white means I was awake, even if I'm not aware of it. <clears throat> so again, I only had 15 minutes of awake that night, hallelujah. I wish they were all like that. So the, the reason for going into that in a bit of depth is because I'm pretty passionate about sleep uh, because it's something I've been working off myself for the last year or so since I got my ring. And I've been able to shift my sleep from less than seven hours a night to about seven and a half. So I've gained about 45 minutes of quality sleep and it's made a massive difference in terms of my energy. So I'm pretty biased, but if you, if you, want, to, uh, if you want to gain more energy, chip away at the sleep will make a big difference. Okay, there's a yellow slide if you wanted to um, add any uh, comments in. We're on to a new activity. Now, this one, before we get into the solutions, before we go into um, tools and things that you can do to find your new norm, there's a little bit more activity work. So I want you to grab your pads. Hold on, here comes a comment. <laughs> I'll tell you at the end when we do our Q&A. <clears throat> Thanks for asking, Helen. Actually, you tell me how old I am. There's a bit of gray here, so there's a hint. Okay, feel free to drop numbers in the chat. Well, let's have a little uh, competition. I'll send someone a prize if they get my age right. So um, this activity is involving a little more reflection, but it's also data gathering. And I'm a bit of a data geek, as you've probably gathered. And I want to go... Um, in through four slides. Now, 
my recommendation is that you take your phones out and shoot, um, photo each of the four because <clears throat> once we've gone past, it's going to be more tricky to come back. Otherwise, we're going to be doing this. So there's four different sections. There's four different slides. And each slide has about five or six statements. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be scoring yourself on these statements. And then you end up with a total for each of the four slides. And that's going to help you prioritize um, those areas and work on what could be impacting your body in terms of what's going into your bucket. So if your bucket list was bigger on the inside than the outside, the next four slides will really help you drill down on what could be going on so that you can help your health. So let me just, I like that slide. It's a wicked photo. So um, number one. So what I recommend is, I'll give you guys a second or two, is take a snapshot of that, write down your scores now, and you can come back and write out the, the questions later if you like. So while you do that, I'll just talk through them. So number one is lifestyle. You're gonna score a five if, you, if it's most likely, and a one if it's least likely. So from a lifestyle point of view, most of my food is packaged. In other words, it's processed, uh, it's not from its um, an original state. So it's got multiple ingredients, let's say. Number two, I've been on diets to lose weight. Quite simple. You have or you haven't. Um, I move less than 30 minutes five days a week. So, you know, you've got a sliding scale of one to five here. I regularly go to bed later than 1030. You know why? Um, I drink less than two liters of water a day. I remember scoring one to five. I drink more than eight alcoholic drinks a week. Again, scoring one to five. So you should have one, two, three, four, five, six different scores there. Quickly do the maths to give yourself a subtotal for lifestyle. Hopefully you've taken a photo with your, with your phone as well so you can refer back. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, if that's a problem, please chuck a comment in the chat and we will we will come back just a bit of two in front number two mental and emotional again you're scoring one to five number one i worry too much sorry that was number two <laughs> i work too much number two i worry a lot i just blended those two together nicely number three often feel highly stressed four no time to myself Five, feeling anxious or guilty often. 23. <laughs> Somebody's after a prize. Nice one, Marianne. Appreciate the, uh, appreciate the, the compliment there. And the uh, last one is I feel often, I feel irritable. I, f I often feel irritable. So that's the mental emotional. So there should be one, two, three, four, five, six scores add those scores up let's move on did you take a photo oh 53 oh what okay thanks marianne thanks for coming i'm not in my 50s okay number three environment so this is about where we are working, where we're living, the, the, the daily environment we put ourselves in, including internal. So the first one is, I have metal fillings or root canals. I smoke or am exposed to smoke. I'm trying to keep up with the chat here. <laughs> yeah, 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 this is, this is, it's hard to see with the light coming in through this window here, but yeah, it's sort of a darky, it's sort of, let's go George, George Clooney, you know, salt and pepper. Um, I have a uh, high electromagnetic field exposure. Now, often people ask me what the hell that means. Do you live near a power pole? Do you live near a cell tower? Or um, do you spend a lot of time in front of a computer? How many people do that? And the last one is high exposure to air or chemical pollution. So people working in factories, uh, people that may be in a manufacturing organization where there is a bit of pollution or chemicals or things going on, <clears throat> that would bump their score up. So that's number three. Number four is metabolism. So this is, you know, what's going on in our body. Um, I have a current or regular infections. 
Uh, I have digestive problems. So I'm not going to go into too much detail there, but um, you may know, or you would know if you have digestive problems, um, are you a regular user of antibiotics? And is your body sore and stiff or stiff and sore on waking? So if you've had a full night's sleep and you wake up stiff, stiff and sore, that could be an indicator that inflammation levels are quite high, unless you did a tough workout and um, you are recovering from a, um, an exercise session. So again, that's just uh, one, two, three, four, a total of four. So that subtotal should give you four different subtotals. And um, all I'd like you to do is make sure you've got those um, four slides photographed because you'll need to go back to those. So you prioritize the highest score of the four. And, um, and that gives you, so the one with the highest score is the one that you go to first. So you can either average the scores because there's more, some have more, some have less. So you could create an average rather than a total. And then that's putting them on a level playing field. Hopefully that all makes sense. Now, I'm gonna drop in a shameless plug here. So you should have a priorities list, like I just said, with, with um, a high score down to a low score. Um, all of the things that we just did on those four slides, I have an online course that if you're interested in pursuing that a little bit more and finding out a little bit more about what you can do, if you text health to 9090, you'll get an autoresponder with a link and that link will take you to the course. I think it's about, it's in US dollars, but I think it's about 20 Kiwi dollars. So it's not crazy expensive. And it steps you through some videos from me and some do downloadable documents that you can fill in. And it just helps you get a little bit deeper in terms of um, what's going on with your health and how you can manage some of those things that are filling your stress bucket. So I've got a yellow slide coming. If you want um, to throw any comments in, feel free to um, do so right away. All right. Now, it's about the halfway here when I want to um, get you guys off your seats, if you're sitting. If you're at a standing desk, you're already winning. Um, I want to show you a breathing technique, which is really good for your thoracic spine, because that's the part of our spine that can get jammed when we're sitting at a computer all day. So this could be your one minute, five minute, however many minute break. I'm gonna show you how this works. I need to stand up to do it. So I'm just gonna get my camera right. Please join me standing. Am I in shot? Yes, cool. Okay, I'll go front on and I'll go side on so you can see how this works. So it's called, it's called spinal breathing. The aim of the game is to fill your lungs, empty your lungs and move your spine, particularly the spine where your ribs are as much as possible. Okay, so work with me. So we're gonna start off in the don't shoot me pose. So hips, uh, so feet under your hips, arms up here, so I'll show you side on, I'm just nice straight back. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll down and into a ball. So I'm gonna drop down, probably not gonna see all of me down here, tilt the camera, roll down. So I've got a curve in my spine, my head is down in between my hands and I've deflated my lungs. So fully down. Then I'm gonna come back up to where I was, fully inflate the lungs, back into the don't shoot me pose. And you want to squeeze those shoulder blades, squeeze those shoulder blades towards each other before you go back down again. Back down, drop down, deflate the lungs, come back up, inflate the lungs. Okay, so we're, we're increasing the size of our rib cage. We're, we're increasing the space between us into the don't shoot me pose and back down. Deflate, deflate, deflate. And repeat. So I'm going fairly slow, but you can do this a little bit quicker. I'm gonna show you one other move. I'm trying to make my breathing as loud as I can. Okay, so let's say we did 10 of those. I'm now gonna use the back of my chair. So I'm bringing that into shot and I'm going to just tilt that away. Now back of the chair here, all I'm going to do is walk my feet away. I'm gonna create some space so that I can drop my head between my arms. So I'm gonna drop my head down, 
hopefully you can still see me. So my head is between my arms and I'm pushing down into the space between my arms, keeping my hands locked on the back of my chair. And then I'm coming back and again, down, drop down, keep the hands on the back. So opening up so you feel those muscles that run down the back, sides of your back, those big lats and back up one more time, dropping down and back up. Okay, so hopefully that was enough of a movement break. We've got your heart rate up a bit. We've um, cleared your head a little bit. And it's really important to keep moving during the day. So <clears throat> I don't wanna go on too much about this, but you know, when we, um, if we do get into that stress state, we've got fight and flight, we also have freeze. We're stuck at our desks, but we're in a stressful state. Our body is deploying energy into our system. You've got the adrenaline. We've got a little bit of cortisol. We've got blood sugars that go up so that we've got that immediate fuel. If we're not using it, it's going to play with our blood sugars. So getting up regularly and moving is a great way to use up some of that energy so that it's not sitting there just pent up and waiting. Great stuff. Hopefully you guys all got up and moved, didn't just sit there and watch me do it. <laughs> Yellow screen if anyone wants to um, throw in any comments. Okay, we're coming into the tips section now. So tips on stressing less. And uh, this plays into um, some of the stuff that I talked about before. And there are some simple habits that you could build into your day or into your week, month, that help um, the mind. This is sort of mind, uh, sorry, that, the mind is the next one. This is purpose. So in terms of sense of purpose, having a sense of purpose is really, really important. It kind of pulls you through your day. It gives you, it gives you direction and it gives you purpose and energy for what you're doing. So obviously you've got tasks, you've got jobs, you've got things that you need to be doing day to day, but having a sense of purpose either for the organization you work for or something higher for yourself can be a really, really useful way of helping create that sense of purpose. So the first thing is the three habits of calm. And there are three, uh, obviously there are three parts. These three, three parts are, one is affirmations. So an affirmation is something that you want to reinforce to your subconscious brain. So you'd write it down or you would say it out loud. So think about what you may consider your negative qualities to be and flip that into the positive. So experiment with this with different affirmations and say out loud multiple times a day and do it every morning if you can, even if you don't feel like it, change it when needed. So an example would be, I'm always late for meetings. And flipping that for the positive could be, I like to prepare thoroughly before meetings. So um, trying to see the positive, reframing it is the next one. So reframing is very, very much what we did there. Write down the experience, focus on the cause and replay the event as if you're an observer. So it's a great way of getting that perspective on situations when you're right down in the middle of it. How can you pull back and just get some more perspective? Write it down, focus on the cause and replay the event as if you're an observer. And the third um, habit of calm is gratitude. So there are three P's of gratitude, person, pleasure or promise feel free to be scribbled. And if you need me to repeat anything, please type something in the comments. <clears throat> person, pleasure or promise. Focus on a person and give them the most gratitude you can. It could be something really simple, like somebody buys you a coffee, you're extremely grateful. Obviously, you don't want to be so, um, so grateful that it looks like you're being sarcastic. Um, so getting the balance right, but it's just having that genuine gratitude. Um, what else could you do? So think for, the, for an experience that you've had that day and, and get pleasure that, and, and pleasure that came from it. So, you know, something nice and simple. You went out for a walk during your lunch, you could hear the birds singing. So you're just taking something in that's helping calm the mind. And finally, identify something that held some promise for the future. So the promise could be, um, a, you know, a holiday that may be coming, obviously that's staying in New Zealand. Um, it could be the long weekend that we just had, you know, it could be the next holiday. Um, something that uh, is, is, you know is coming and something that gives you um, anticipatory pleasure, something that gives you something to look forward to. So 
So um, let me just check my notes. So calm, second one is me time. So in terms of me time, what activities would you like to spend more doing? So think about the time that you have outside of work. What can you do with that time that could bring you pleasure? What are the three most important things that you want to get done? So you could give a little priority list, one, two, three. And which person would you like to spend more time with than you currently do? So that's me time. And finally, so the live principle. So L-I-V-E, which we've got here. Um, so the L stands for love. Do something you love. This is a good one to write down. The I stands for intention. So do something with intent. So do it deliberately, on purpose. And the V stands for vision. Develop a long-term vision. So it could be a hobby. It could be, um, it could be a business. It could be something that you like engaging in that gives you sort of a future promise. And then in, the E stands for engagement. Do something that makes you engage with others. So that's having that human connection. And having that human connection is a great way of buffering stress in itself. So hopefully I didn't whip through those too quickly. If you do have any questions, pre, please fire them through the chat box. Okay, so that's purpose. And the other one I wanted to focus on was mind. Because if we get control of our mind, we can pretty much master anything, can't we? So tech overload. Some questions for you. Do you always carry your phone with you? If you do, is there an opportunity to have a break? Because we know that our brains are stimulated by our phones. How often have you seen people standing in queues waiting for a bus instead of chatting? They're on their phones. They're in this world rather than this world. Um, and that's, that can create anxious, anxiety and, and anxiousness in our, in our brains, in our, in our wiring. And our brains learn to live and enjoy and, and stay in that space. And yet we're missing so much more going on outside of at that space. So could you take a break? Could you schedule a FOMO hour to catch up on social media? So if you looked at your phone and you said, it said that you'd been on there for four hours and 15 minutes, and some of that, you know, it'll tell you how much of that may have been on social media. Could you schedule that social media time so it's in one particular time during the day and the rest of the time, you know, you're doing the other stuff. And the other option is to disable notifications. That may be something you've already done, but disabling notifications is a great way of keeping control of what's going on in your world and not letting the, uh, the device take over. So that's from a tech point of view. To buffer some of that would be to bathe in nature. Now, some of you may know that getting outside in nature is a really, really good thing for our health. Um, some of the things that it does is it, uh, it reduces our blood pressure. Obviously, stress as a, as a general term brings down adrenaline, cortisol, blood sugars as well, which I talked about a minute ago. But it also improves feelings of depression, sleep, memory, concentration, and our immune function, which, of course, is that whole blood flow when we're in fight or flight. So getting out into nature is really good for our brains. And by taking that break, we're giving our brains the opportunity to get creative. When we have our best thoughts is often when we're having a little pause in what we're normally doing. And, um, and when those great ideas come to us, that's when we can be really creative. So um, it's more than just having a break. It's, it's actually giving our brains opportunity to uh, come up with ideas. Take time to breathe. And I think this is probably the classic that most people would know about in terms of calming the nervous system, looking after your health and staying out of that fight or flight state, taking time to breathe. Um, I, was watching a, um, I was watching a show on, I think it's Neon, and it's called, um, it's called Billions. And it's all about a, um, an investment banker who is extreme, extremely wealthy and he's fighting with the district attorney who's trying to take him down. So you may know the, the show. Something I noticed really interesting was that both these characters, the main lead characters, there were snippets of them sitting in their offices with their phone by their side, counting down the time, and they were doing breathing exercises. And I thought it was an interesting addition to a show, which is all about making money and taking the guy down and, and um, you know, pretty aggressive stuff where they had this same daily habit where they would sit in their offices for a, you know, five minutes and just have a breathe. And so, you know, there's, 
you know, that, good, good leadership, good, good opportunity to share that with the general public, but something that we can do ourselves. And we can build that into a break or we can build that into a walk. It doesn't have to be just sitting quietly, particularly if you work in an office where it's open plan and you've got people around you, not so easy to do. But that could be a good excuse to get outside and get closer to nature and just do some breathing. One of my favorites, which is difficult for people to know that you're doing it, is alternate nostril breathing. So what you do, get you to join me here, is you use um, a thumb and a finger. It doesn't matter which, whatever's the most comfortable for you. And you could just rest you in your hand. Breathe in through one nostril, block it off. Breathe out through the other nostril. In through one. Out through the other. And because you're using the nose to go in and out, it helps to slow things down. And it's just a really great uh, drill to do. Helps clear your mind, helps get some clarity and, uh, and really helps you, um, helps your mind. So stress less tips, yellow screen, productivity. Talked a little bit about um, notifications. There are other ways in which you can be productive. Now, um, I don't know if you guys have access to um, all of the social media websites on your work computers, but if you do, there's a great way of filtering them. Um, if you use Chrome as your preferred um, web browser, there's a plugin called Mindful Browsing. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to set a timer for accessing, let's say, Facebook. And after 10 minutes or however long you tell it, it will shut Facebook down and it will give you a, a saver screen. Um, and you can apply as many different websites to this a mindful browsing as you want. So you tell it the site, you tell it how long, and you tell it what you would do instead. So if I go onto Facebook, it says, you said you wanted to do some breathing. So it's a great way of short circuiting that habit that if you were going to go onto social media or onto a website that you particularly enjoyed, you could just uh, circumvent that by having this uh, web browser set up and mindful browsing kicks in, helps you cut out the noise and stay focused. Um, another one is, uh, is, is the blocking method. And it's probably something you would have already come across, but it's a way of um, watching the, the multitasking because technically we can't multitask. Uh, we can do one job at a time really, really well, and we can try and do multiple jobs, but actually it's one at a time, even if we are shifting from to the next. And that can be pretty exhausting. And I'm going to come on to that in a minute in terms of brain. Um, and the last one is the 135 method, which is a really useful tool for getting focused. So what you would do at the beginning of the day, you would say, what's my one big, one big task? And it may possibly be more than a day's task. It could be a two or three day task, but one task, one big task that needs to get done. The three would then be two, would be three medium sized tasks that need to get done. So they would take a little bit longer than just five minutes, but they're sort of semi significant. And then five, the five would be real short, simple ones. And uh, when I was putting this slide together, the example I read was uh, booking the dental appointment. And as I was writing this, I picked the phone up, rang my dentist, said, I haven't seen you for ages. When can I see you? So it works. So the five is short, short, you know, booking appointments or doing those tiny little tasks that need to get done, but that can easily slip off our radar when we get busy and we, uh, we get sort of, you know, into the day. So one, three, five, really, really useful. Um, now, I am not the guru of personal productivity tips, and I wanted to ask you guys if you could share some of yours, because there may be some you do <clears throat> that... Um, other people can learn from because you're not all in the same space. So if you're happy to quickly get on the chat and tap away and share some of the things that you do to, Kate, to, to, to stay on track, to, to be as productive as you can, would love to hear those comments now. So feel free to jump into the chat, just type in you know, two or three words, whatever it may be, and then people can, um, people can borrow those themselves. Cool. Uh, that's great, Michelle. I'm assuming that when you say we, right, um, it's like a team thing. So, you know, then that, that list may be divvied up amongst multiple people.
Yeah, cool. Yep, general consensus from Workmates. Nice. Yep, great stuff. Good, good, good. Any others before I move on? Who's your most difficult off your list first? Yeah, this will make you better. I like that, Serena. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, you may have heard of the expression eat the frog. And that's the, that's that's what that represents. No, no one really wants to eat the frog, but um, eat the frog first, you'll feel productive. You'll get that little bit of dopamine hit. That's that feel good hormone. That's a reward hormone or it's a neurotransmitter. So once you've eaten the frog, you kind of like, yes, I'm on a high, I've achieved this. Now I'll get this, 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 and this done. So um, that's a really good, great idea. Any others, any others, any others? Cool. Uh, well, if they pop up, I will come back to them. That's good. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. Let's just look at um, yellow screen. Why routine? So this is kind of, this is the, the 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 crux of the matter in terms of um, finding your new new routine because we've been you know in and out of lockdowns we've been working from home we've been working from the office um, it's been a challenge on our energy levels but also on our routine we love routine our subconscious minds drive us to work sometimes without us even noticing you've had a phone call or you've been listening to the radio and you don't realize that you've just driven the last 10 kilometers without actually noticing much about what's been going on and that's your subconscious brain knowing how to drive and knowing the route and really doing the job for you, that's routine. But when we get out of those routines, it takes a whole lot more energy to achieve the same outcome or a different outcome a different way. So routine can really anchor us. It helps us um, reduce the anxiety of coming out of the cave and is it a rainbow or is it a saber tooth tiger? So um, that's why finding a new routine or changing our routine uh, can be challenging but if you can if you find the thing that works for you that will bring those stress levels down it will create new daily habits an example from me is um, as a result of lockdown I have a face-to-face -face business but it stopped it literally stopped and I had to go on I had to start doing more things via my camera and my my headphone and um, and that was a challenge because I'd never done it before and so I was learning on the go while I was delivering these sessions and um, and now I do it all the time because it's now I now have a stream in my business which is just online. Um, and that's something I never thought I would do. I didn't even intend to do it. I was reaching out to people in lockdown and saying, hey, look, is everybody OK? Let's do this. Let's do that. And now it's become a stream to my business. So that's my new new uh, routine. I talked about sleep. But of course, when we get thrown out of our daily routines, that can also impact our sleep. And we saw how important sleep is in terms of recovering and going back to zero in terms of our, our mental and physical um, uh, wellness. Sleep is a, is a key and it's something that should really be prioritized. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and of course, routine helps us build the important things into our lives, like um, you know, eating well, having a healthy diet and, um, and, and allowing time for exercise. You know, when we were locked down, we had all the time in the world if we weren't um, getting up at the normal time because we didn't have to commute, perhaps. That wasn't necessarily for everybody. If you're an essential worker, it wasn't. But, you know, we had that little bit more time to get out and exercise, and that could have become a, a permanent thing for some people. Um, so that's why routine is so important. And how does it work for our brain? Well, as I said, um, our brain's very hungry. So our brain's very, very good at doing things on autopilot, but when we're not on autopilot, it chews through more energy than it normally would. So of the daily calories that our, our whole body expends, 20%, a whole fifth of that is just our brains chewing through energy. So that's an enormous percentage of our daily energy requests that our brain needs. And that's when it's on normal mode. It's in normal mode. So it's on a, a reasonable amount of autopilot because we've got good routines. When we step out of those routines, that 20% actually goes up. So you can see why it might be um, exhausting to have different routines, a change of routines, um, additional multitasking, shift of offices, um, online, offline. Um, so, you know, the, the, the challenge to our brain is, is greater. And so our exhaustion can come as a result of that uncertainty. 
So um, I wanted to uh, want to do a little exercise, so pens and papers ready, and just give you a feel for what it's like for your brain when it has to do something it's not used to doing and how much energy, effort, and concentration is required. So are your pens ready? Here we go. And the challenge is write your full name using a non-dominant hand. Go. unless you've got three or four middle names. I'm guessing you're getting close to the end now. Done, nice one, Serena. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, it was, Pip. <clears throat> now I'm gonna get you to go back to your pen, back to your paper and do it with your good hand, go. Done, yeah, half the time, eh? Thanks for typing, by the way, really good. <laughs> so, <clears throat> awesome, look at that, nice, Serena. It does feel better, doesn't it? So if you extrapolate that out, the handwriting thing, to a shift in your routines, a shift in your um, habits <clears throat> on a bigger scale in terms of your life, you know, finding your new routine is, is quite important from an energy saving point of view, from a concentration point of view, you saw how challenging it was to go with the, the non-dominant hand. Because what you're doing is you're asking your brain to fire new pathways to your hand muscles via your arm to shift the pen to do, the, to do your name that it isn't used to doing, right? <clears throat> I know I'm, I'm obviously teaching you um, how to suck eggs here, and it, but explaining the process. Now, you know, that that therefore requires practice and practice and practice and practice. If you ever broken your dominant hand and had to use your non-dominant for the six weeks that you were in plaster, you would have already had a good sense of this and how challenging it can be and how tired you could pro probably be at the end of each day as a result of having to use that non-dominant hand. So, you know, be, being kind to yourself, being aware that this is something that we've been going through um, through COVID is, is something to, um, you know, just, just, just to be aware of three good things i'm nearly there and why so three good things this couple, couple of slides before we talked about um uh, being grateful to somebody you know having that real real genuine sense of gratitude and there was a study done which is called three good things on gratitude and they found that people who practiced gratitude on a daily basis had um what did they have they had uh, improved sense of well-being. I'll give you some stats in a minute. <clears throat> um, they were less aggressive. They were more curious, um, seeking answers and looking forwards, not backwards. Um, so they were much more positive in their thinking. Now, there's some rules around it, and it's something that you can do very easily. If you're into journaling and writing things down with your dominant hand, um, it can be a really useful exercise because it helps keep the brain in a positive state. So you remember I talked about um, rainbow and saber tooth tiger we're wired for the danger and the negative so we need to really work quite hard to stay in the positive so the people that were in this study who did three good things so all they did so that means they thought about three good things in their day so it could be had a really easy journey into work traffic was great had a lovely lunch with my friend and um you know uh, looking, you know, had a, a fantastic dinner with my partner, whatever it may be. It really, it doesn't have to be big. And um, so this is the, this is what came out of it. When they did that for a week, they were measured, their happiness was measured. They were 2% happier after one week. If they did it for a month, so four weeks, they were 5% happier. And those that did it for six months, who stayed in the study for six months, they were 9% happier. So, you know, I think 2% um, for a week is massive compared to nine for six months, right? So I'm not saying it just do it for a week, but these are the rules. If you're going to do it, there are some, there's some structure around it. 
And this is how it works. Writing down is vital to help keep you focused on the events in a structured way. So writing it down is different to typing. Your brain processes it differently. So it could be a scrap of paper. It doesn't have to be a journal. Reflecting on what you did is essential as it adds to your sense of perceived control and well-being. When we feel in control, when all of those things around us may be a little bit in flux, it helps keep those things under wraps and our well-being. So that's the second one. And the third is timing. Timing is significant. So the research says either do it every day for a week or try it once a week for weeks. So that's probably really important because it's something you should give it a go. I reckon it's worth doing um, or at least trying and just seeing how your sense of well-being is. All right, nearly there. Yellow slide. New routines and why. So we're we're at the we're at the um, finish line here, guys. So I talked a second a bit about dopamine. That's that reward a neurotransmitter in our brains. That's what we get when we hit when people like our social posts. Um, it's something that happens when we achieve the great things. We get this we get this metaphorical pat on the back that helps us feel good. So when you create a new routine, you're actually helping reinforce it because you get that dopamine hit. And it's, a, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, when you exercise and you feel good, or if you've exercised and you do have had that feeling of feeling good, that's dopamine helping you feel good. It's one of those neurotransmitters that's like, well done, you've done yourself a good deed. So by looking for new routines, by finding those new routines and putting things in place, either uh, blocking things or planning things, writing them down, you're gonna get that feedback inside your body that says, well done. So it's almost saying, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. So the thing to think about is focus on the process and not the outcome. Obviously you may have thought about the outcome, but focus on the process of stacking those habits together so that you get that dopamine reward. And that will help you reinforce your new routine or your new habit so that it becomes permanent. And it feels more normal so that you, it feels like writing with your right hand rather than writing with your left hand. And you get that, that effort, for, effort versus reward feeling. So you know you've put time into it because it's taken energy like it was writing with your left hand, but you're getting the reward as well. So it feels like it's worth it. And like I talked about at the beginning, it builds resilience, right? So when we've been stretched and we've been pushed into our, our, our outside of our comfort zones, we're building resilience a little bit at a time. And that helps us both physically and mentally. So hopefully that sums things up reasonably well there. The last slide I just wanted to talk about was where to from here. So what is it that you personally want to do from what you've heard? And what is it that you might want to take back to the people you work with that you think could be useful? So um, I want to uh, leave those questions in your mind. You don't have to answer me now. Um, I want to skip to the last slide and um, ask for any questions and hopefully I can provide answers. So feel free to um, throw anything else into the chat that you want to, including my age. Um, and um, I'll hopefully answer it. I also want to thank you for your time. It's been a big chunk of your day listening to me. I hope that was useful. I hope there were some nuggets in there for each of you. Um, and, um, you know, if you want to reach out, I am on Facebook, Richard Ellis, even though I introduced myself as Rich because only my mother calls me Richard. Um, and I'd love to, to connect if you guys are wanting more help. So far away with the question. Here we go. Okay. Oh, Marianne, 45. I like you, Marianne. Very close. Very close. Any other questions <laughs> other than age related? Okay. Well done, Serena. Uh, okay. Next birthday, Carla. Next birthday. So Serena, you win the prize. Um, feel free to uh, put your email in here and I will send, I'll get some details from you and I'll send you a prize. Serena is the winner. I'll write that down because if I don't, I'm sure I can find out who you are, Serena, from somebody. <laughs> well, thank you okay. so much, Rich. Um, it's, it's been no problem. Uh, really, really good. I'm definitely going to try the 135 method. I think ah. 
think that for me personally could could make a difference to my day. So awesome. um, yeah, a big thank you from from all of us here. And um, it doesn't look like we've got any questions coming through, but um, like I said, we can reach out through Facebook if we've yeah. got any questions post post webinar. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, and so everyone, uh, if you do have a moment, um, we've got a short survey after when you log off, um, just to just to give the committee some feedback, just to make sure whether these webinars are working for everybody, if there's anything that we could change, that type of thing. Um, but otherwise, thank you once again to Rich. Thank you. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Take care. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, well, Cool. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think we just go leave. Yeah. Okay. Um, See you guys. Okay. Radio. Bye. Bye.